So good morning, good afternoon to everybody, depending on your time zone. So I'm going to be covering um, really one of my favorite topics today. We're going to be taking a quick tour of the various Linux tools that are out there for doing text processing. So let me just go ahead and share my screen. So if okay, keep an eye on the chat. Um, we um, Cindy has been posting the bit.ly link to Complex. Um, that is a folder where you can find the PDF for this presentation and for all of our previous presentations, if you wanted to follow along there. Um, we also have a GitHub repo accompanying this talk um, in the SCSC Complex Organization Linux Text Tools. Oh, there we go. So just a, a brief reminder about what Complex is. So this is a um, NSF-funded program, stands for Comprehensive Learning for End Users to Effectively Utilize Cyber Infrastructure. And the idea behind Complex is that we're teaching the non-programming skills that you need to effectively use supercomputers. So we have a whole variety of topics. Um, about a month ago, we covered parallel computing concepts, intermediate Linux, Today we'll be going over um, over Linux tools for for file processing. In the future, there will be um, security, bash computing, how to get help, data management, and interactive computing. So we're recognizing that many of our users are no longer developers of of software, but rather using somebody else's application. But we realize also that there's a lot of skills that you need to know in order to be able to effectively use HPC. So um, I'm going to be um, po posting the table of contents um, at, at each section. This will make it easy if you want to go back and look at the slides to get to a particular section. So starting off with our introduction. So I'm going to say, you know, th this session is really intended for anybody who needs to post-process text files, extract runtimes, results, or information about the hardware using calculations. Um, it could also be used for pre-processing. Um, Preprocess and input. And I'll be showing a few examples later. So it will be useful when constructing workflows, preparing high throughput computing workloads. And yep, I mentioned that already preprocessing data. So the Linux environment gives you a wide range of tools for sorting, splitting, manipulating files, along with tools for extracting content based on location or value. So today we're going to be covering split, head, tail, aux, sed, grep, paste, and actually a few more, a few more that didn't make it into this slide. Um, some of these tools have lots of options. Toward the end of the presentation, we'll be talking about aux and sed, um, but we're going to be going over just the basics to keep things a little more manageable. All right. So to start off, um, you know, life is complex. Computing is complex. And you're probably thinking, you know, do I really need to um, do I really need to learn yet another tool or more tools? And I agree, um, I find it kind of overwhelming too. But I'm going to say a little bit of investment at your time, of your time now, can um, save you a lot of time in the future. So when I look at these tools, I really see, um, you know, three three advantages to to using these Linux text processing tools. So first of all, you know, while you could do a lot of these tasks by hand, and I had done this many times over the years um, before I learned about some of these tools, um, first of all, the process is time consuming. Um, you're gonna spend a lot more time, especially if you're doing high throughput computing and going through lots and lots of output. Um, it's tedious. You know, by the time you get done doing some of these text manipulations on, on, on your own, you know, you're, you're probably mentally tired and you've been, um, you know, maybe kind of you, you, you used up your um, capacity for the day and it makes you less effective for the rest of the day. But I'm going to say probably the biggest reason to use these tools is that when you do the text manipulations by hand, opening files, cutting and pasting, sticking things in the spreadsheets, it could be really, really error prone. And this is going to be especially true if this needs to be done many, many times. Um, especially if you're um, doing doing high put high throughput computing and potentially have thousands of files that you need to process. So what we're going to do is use some of these tools to automate the process. 
Now you could you could do this in software. You could write um, you, you could write Perl or Python scripts to do this. Um, but what we're going to do here is focus on using these tools and try to keep things um, re relatively simple. In fact, in most of the cases, it's going to be simple one-liners. So we have hands-on examples accompanying this presentation. We posted a link to the GitHub repo showing examples of the usage of each tool. So you can either download the Jupyter Notebook or if you go to the repo at the bottom, you'll see that there's a binder link. Um, if you're unfamiliar with binder, this is a facility where um, images of notebooks are, are, are pre-built, pre-compiled. They're available on the web and you will be running on a CPU somewhere on the web. You might need to, um, you might need to wait a few minutes sometimes in order to, in order for your, for your notebooks to launch, but it's a really convenient way to do these. And I'm going to say, if you want to master these tools, um, you know, try, try out here, here are a few recommendations. I'm going to say, deliberately introduce errors, leave out quotes, commas, or semicolons, see what happens. Run through the examples that I'm providing, and then try extending them to add new features. Try chaining the tools together to create more complex workflows. And best of all, I'm going to say applying these tools to your own use cases. I find that, you know, wh whether it's a, a Linux tool or a um, new, new programming language, that I really learn it best when I um, apply it to a, to a real problem. So we're going we're gonna to jump in, start um, discussing some of these tools. Um, I'm going to begin um, with what I think are, are the simplest tools, and we're pretty much going to... Um, go, go, go from the simplest to, to the more complex tools. So we're going to start with head and tail. Um, and these, these are Linux utilities used to output the first or the last part of a file. Um, I'm going to guess that many of you have used head or tail already. So by default, if you use head or tail, you're going to get the first 10 or the last 10 lines of a file. So I have a file here called file.txt. I do head, I'm going to get the first 10 lines. And if you open up this file, you'll see that it simply has lines labeled line one, line two, line three, and so on. If I do tail, I'm going to get the last 10, last 10 lines of the file. Um, as expected, um, all of these tools have, have, um, have multiple options. You can override the defaults and you can specify the number of output lines. So for example, if I wanted to see just the first seven lines of a file, I could do head dash n seven file, followed by the file name. So I'm gonna get lines one through seven. Or if I wanna see the last seven lines of the file, I could use tail dash n seven and get lines 14 through 20. So pretty simple tool, um, very, very useful though. Um, one option that you might not be familiar with though, is that we can, um, we, we can also specify that all but the last number of lines be output or all lines from, uh, from a certain point onward, onward or output. So we're gonna look at this. Um, for example, if we do um, head dash n, dash 15, what I'm going to see is all of the output except the last 15 lines. And if I do tail dash n plus 16, that means I want to see all of the lines following the first 16 lines. So um, these, these are a couple of options that we don't use as often, but they um, sometimes, sometimes come in handy. Okay, so I'm taking a look at the chat. I don't see any questions here that there yet, and I wasn't really expecting any since head and tail are pretty straightforward. Okay, the, the next command I'm gonna talk about is paste. And I find this one really, really useful when I'm what, working with data from, from multiple files. So what paste does is it's gonna merge the lines of a file. So it's gonna combine two or more files line by line and by default, the tab is going to be used as the delimiter for pasting these files together, but this can be overridden with the dash D option. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have um, had to do something like this already. For, um, 
for, for many years, I didn't know about pace. So what I would do is ma manually um, to take the output of a file, cut it, I would paste it into a spreadsheet. And then I would find, you know, I'd create another column, paste the data from another file into that spreadsheet. So let's look at a, at a couple of simple examples. We have um, two files we're gonna work with. We're gonna call it fruits and colors, fruits.txt and colors.txt. And we'll look at the content of these two files. So fruits has apple, banana, and grape. Um, colors has um, red, 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 yellow, and purple. And if I just want to um, so combine these two files so that I have um, one, one column coming from fruits, the other column coming from um, coming from colors, I could do a paste fruits.txt, colors.txt. And now I get the output apple red, banana yellow, grape purple. And you could see that we are, um, you know, from the spacing that we are um, using tabs to set, separate the columns. Um, if we want to change our delimiter, we can use the dash D option. This is really gonna be handy if you want to generate a file, say a CSV file that you can then open in Excel. So same command, except now we're gonna do paste dash D. And then in quotes, I have a comma. This is gonna be my new, new delimiter. It could be anything. You're gonna find most often though it might be a single space or a, um, or a comma. My two files and now my output is Apple comma comma red, banana comma yellow, grape comma purple. So we now have something that we can easily import into um, into Excel. I'm just going to um, no, Cindy, I've lost the I've lost the chat. Do we have any questions so far? No, not at this time. Okay. Yeah, so if you if you um and I'll see if I could get that back. Um yeah, I've I've lost chat. So at the end of each section, if you could check for questions and let me know, I'll go ahead and answer them. Sounds good. All right. Okay, um then the next command that they're gonna cover is called NL. What this does is it adds line numbers to a file. So this is one of those commands. Um, I actually learned this one fairly recently. I'm not gonna consider it to be an essential command because there are other ways you could do this um, using other tools. Um, but as you'll see in this slide, the um, the, the options I think are, are a, li a little more awkward. So if we just do NL followed by the name of our file, it's going to output that file with each line um, prepended by a line number. So we do nl fruits.txt. We now get one apple, two banana, three grape. Um, if you're not happy with the output, um, you'll notice that the um, that the one that the um, that numbering begins in about column six. These are um, right, 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 justified. We could use the dash n option, dash n um, ln for for. I think LN stands for, for left numbering. So now we get we get um, left justified line numbers. Now there are other ways we could have done this. We could um, we we could have used the Linux seek command seq. Um, with input inputting the number of lines in the in fruits.txt. So I'm using wc l. Um, piping in fruits.txt and we're capturing the output in backticks and then um, paste that into a temporary file. So um, sending the output to a temporary file and then using paste to combine them. I could use awk, which I'm going to be showing a little bit later. But if you just want to do the simple line numbering, this is a straightforward way to do it. Okay, so we're gonna start getting into um, to tools that are just a little more complex. Now, sort is one that we find ourselves using, using a lot. Um, again, you, you might have experience um, so sorting files by taking your data, pasting it into a spreadsheet, um, to doing it doing it in Excel. Um, we can also do this programmatically use it using sort. So without any arguments, sort is done by lexi lexicographical order, basically alphabetical order. 
Um, I'm just going to say be aware that the handling of upper and lowercase letters is going to depend on, on, on the settings of your environment variables, in particular, lc underscore all. So we're going to look at a file, and we're going to call it unsorted1.txt. And we have a listing of lit list of fruits. Notice, though, that we have upper and lowercase um, words in there. So we have banana with capital B, apple with lowercase a, grape, pear, apple, peach, banana, grape, orange. Um, we also do have some have some replication, as you notice. If I do sort um, on that, we will find that typically, um, given the given the default setting for the LC underscore all environment variable, that typically we'll get the um, the result that we're expecting a um, alphabetical sort with the with the case ignored. So we get. You know, we get um, our two occurrences of apple, our two occurrences of banana, followed by grape, orange, peach, pear. Um, banana follows uh, follows apple, comes before a grape, you know, grape and orange, um, e even though it is uppercase. If we had set our environment variable though, lc underscore all to c, now we're going to get what we call an ASCII, uh, ASCII ordering where the um, uppercase letters have a um, uh, occur before the lowercase letters. And now we'll find that, that banana, grape occur before apple, orange, peach, and pear since they are uppercase. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that a lot of you have used sort already, but we're gonna go a little bit deeper. Um, we, we can choose the field that we're gonna do the sorting by. We can also choose to sort sort by numeric value. So let's look at another file. Um, we're going to call this one unsorted2.txt. And you'll see that there are three fields. You know, the first column is a, is a fruit, that the second field is a number, and the third is, um, is a food. So if I do a um, sort dash k3 on this file, you see that I'm now doing a sorting on the, on, on the third column. So, so now that last column, the um the files are listed so that we begin um so that we're sorted alphabetically by that third field. So now the um, third column has hot dog, pizza, popcorn, pretzel, taco. The rest of the content of that row is carried along. So we don't have any any scrambling of the and any scrambling of the data. So for example, the row that contains grape 23 hot dog appears together again at the top of our list. So in the next example, we're going to look at sorting on that second column. So here we're going to do a dash K2, sorting in the second column instead of the third. And now you'll notice um, that the results look a little odd. So if we're sorting on the, um, on, on the second column, you see that we have 12, 17, 23, 35, 6, which is probably not what we we're expecting. Um, we need to explicitly tell um, to tell sort that we are sorting on a um, on a numerical field. So in the next example, we do a sort dash k two dash n unsorted two dot text, and now we're getting the getting the results that we expect. So what sort is doing is on the sort field, it is um, treating um, unless we unless we specify otherwise, say with the dash n option. It's treating that that field as a as a string. Uh, we can limit the um, the results of the sort to unique values by specifying the dash u option. So um, again, we're look, we look at our unsorted file. We look at our sorted file, and we had done this before. And if we do a sort dash u unsorted one dot text. We see that each of the um, e each of the rows that that is repeated multiple times. So, for example, apple, banana, and grape is only going to appear once. And then finally, um, we can use sort to um, to do a sort on multiple columns. This is something that we've probably done in Excel a lot. Um, where we say sort on column one and then on column two. We can do this using the, using the sort utility. 
by um, specifying multiple dash K options for multi-column multi -column sorts. Um, syntax looks a little funny. Um, typically we'll say dash K N comma N. Um, what this does is it restricts the sort to only the data in that column. This is what we normally want to do. And we can include R's and N's for reverse and numeric sorts. So now we're going to look at another file, unsorted3.txt. Um, and here we're going to sort on the third column, then on the first column, and then finally on the, on the second column. So you see that we, we have all of the rows that have Canada um, in the third column, followed by Mexico, followed by USA. Then we said we we're going to sort on the first column. So within, within the rows that, that end in Canada, we're going to have our um, apple banana within Mexico, apple banana within USA, apple banana. And then finally sorting on color so that it's always green and then red. Um, in, the, um, in the other example, um, we're just showing how we can do reverse sorts. Here we're going to do a reverse, um, reverse alphabetical sort on the second column. That's the dash K2R comma two. So now we get all of the rows containing red in the second field, followed by green in the second field, and then sorting by the first and finally the third columns. So sort gives us a lot of power to do the to do these multi-column sorts. Something that if you weren't familiar with the more advanced features of sort, you might have tried doing manually again in Excel. Finally, um, one last option with sort is that it has an option to randomly shuffle the lines in a file. But I'm going to say be careful with this. Because of the way it's implemented, um, identical lines are always going to appear next to each other, which is probably not what you want. Um, you know, what's going on under the hood is if you use sort, it's going to calculate a hash for each row of the file. And then when we randomize, it's going to take all of the files with the, sorry, all of the lines with the same hash and put them next to each other. So there might be a time when you want to do this, but I'm going to guess that more often, if you're doing this random shuffling, that you probably want a true random shuffling. And that's why we're going to use the shuff utility. So let's take, um, you know, look at a file abc.txt. We've got three occurrences of A, three occurrences of B, three occurrences of C. If I do a sort dash R, dash capital R, abc.txt, you'll see that we um, do have a degree of randomness. And if you run this um, multiple times, you might see BCA, CAB, um, all of the different permutations. But you'll notice that all of the occurrences of B are occurring together, all the occurrences of C, all the occurrences of A. Um, what we probably want to do is use shuff. If we use shuff abc.txt, you see that we truly have a, um, have, a, have a random sorting. And then finally, if we just need a random permutation of integers, you could take the output from seek, um, the seq command, and pipe that into shuff. And we talked about seek, seek, sorry, seek in the um, previous um, workshop on, on intermediate Linux. So here we took seek nine, pipe that into shelf, and now we have a random permutation of the first nine integers. Okay, I am not seeing any. There we go. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Again, if you have any questions, post them there. I didn't really expect to get too much at this point. All right. So next, we are going to um, look at the split command. So sometimes you'll have a sorry. Actually, let me go back to um, go go back to shuff real, real quickly. So you're wondering why might I want to shuffle the um, sh shuffle the input? Sorry, sorry, shuffle the lines of a file. And the the one that that really jumped out at me is what I'm going to say is um, the deep learning applications. So if you are trying to train a model, you have data you need to sort it into. Um, and in, into your training, your validation, and your testing sets. Um, often, though, you might have, say, the listing of the listing of the images that you're using for the training. It might be, say, all of your pictures of dogs followed by all of your pictures of cats and so on. Or it might include an order in which the pictures were taken. 
And that's going to, if we just divide that into, say, the first 80%, the next 10%, the next 10%, as we typically do in a deep learning um, training application, um, it's not going to work very well. We don't have a, a mix of each of each image type and, and training um, validation and testing. So this would be a good way to, um, to, to, to randomize that. Okay, so we're going to move on to split. So split is used to split a file into pieces. Um, one case where I've had to do this was a bioinformatics application where I had a um, where I had a FASTA file containing um, a large number of of protein amino acid sequences, and I wanted to break that into manageable chunks that it could then process separately in, in different batch jobs. So I use the use the split command. If I specify split without any options, um, I'm going to get output um, files named XAA, XAB, and so on. Um, and they're all going to be um, 1,000 lines in size. So you can see here that it is split on genome.fasta. And my output was um, XAA, XAB through XAG sorry, XAJ, and those um, th those first files all contain 1,000 lines. You'll notice that last one has 991 lines. So if a file cannot be divided evenly, the last output is going to be um, is going to be the remainder, what whatever's left. Um, we have a few options that we could pass to split. Um, we can um, specify what the chunk size is going to be. In this case, I use dash L 2000. So now we're going to get chunks of 2000 lines. And then after the file name, I can specify the prefix that I want to use. So let's say I didn't want to use names like XAA, XAB, and so on. Here I use um, genome underscore. And now my files are named genome underscore AA, AB, AC, and so on. And as we expect, that last chunk, um, that last chunk has whatever's left over since the number of lines of the file was not evenly, di evenly divisible by 2000. All right, um, one of the, um, I'm gonna say what well, one of the complications when using split is that sometimes files are gonna have well-defined structure such as the FASTA, FASTA files I've been describing you use for genomic data. And the default record separator, say a new line character, can lead to undesired behavior. So in this case, um, and don't worry if you if you don't have a bioinformatics background, um, th these files contain a a, a header for, for for each record. So so in this case, kind of the cryptic SPQ six eleven fifty one and so on, followed by the followed by the sequence data, and although we're splitting this file. We want to keep that information together. So if I just um, look, look through the result of the split, I'll see that the first file, as expected, begins with a it begins with the header. The second file, though, begins somewhere in the middle, um, which means that my that my protein sequence was split across two files. And same thing with the third file. So what we can do with split is specify a different record separator using the dash T option. Um, the only wrinkle here is that we need to, um, but we, we, we need to know how that delimiter occurs in the file because it's going to split on all of those occurrences. And another thing to keep in mind is that the delimiter is consumed when, when we do the split. So now if we look at the results, split dash L, this means I'm going to be splitting into um, chunks of 200, not necessarily lines anymore, um, since I have a, um, a, a new record separator, dash T, um, and then quotes the greater than sign, which is where all of my, which, which is the first character in each of the annotations. Now, when I did split, results are looking, the results are looking better, but you'll notice there's one, um, what, one issue, and that is, that that for um, all of the files after the first one, we lost that that greater than sign at the beginning of um, at the beginning of each annotation, and I'll show how to fix that later. 
Let me see if we have any questions yet. Okay, still no questions. All right, so we're gonna um, <clears throat> go to the um, next set of tools, right? Rec, Sed, and Awk, which are the next level up in complexity. So grep, we're going to use to print lines that match a pattern. So at its very simplest, grep returns all lines in a file containing the search string. Oh, so let me just check the check here. Um, yeah, so good, good question for from Hector. Why is the separator lost? Um, you know that that has to do with the with the implementation of. Um, with, with, with the implementation of split. And I need to look into that, um, but that's something that to the best of my knowledge, we don't have, um, we, we don't have control over. Um, I, yeah, so, so let, let me follow up on that. I'm gonna say the, the answer is pretty much that's just the way it is. Um, and probably because the developers of grep figured that that is the kind of behavior that we would normally want. So let's say that if we had a, um, you know, we, we had a file where it was a, say, say a, a single long line with, with strings that were separated by commas. The thinking of the developers of, of Split was probably just that we don't really want those commas. Um, that's not part of the data. It's just something that delimits the data. All right. So let me, um, sorry, Chad. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Hector. Okay. So now we're going to, um, Look, look at look at tools that are a little more complex. We're going to be starting with grep. And we use this to print the lines that match a pattern. So at the very simplest, grep returns all lines in the file that contain the search string. Um, remember that upper and lowercase letters are different characters, and you'll need to use the dash I flag if you want your matches to be case insensitive. So we're going to go back to um, um, you know, sample input file. In this case, it's called file.1.txt, file1.txt. And each record has lit list three fruits, apple, banana, pear, cherry, banana, peach, orange, lemon, lime, and so on. So if I want to find all of the files that contain banana, banana starting with lowercase b, I just do grep banana file1.txt. And then I get these two lines, apple, banana, pear, cherry, banana, peach. If I wanted to find all the all the lines that contained banana with an uppercase B, we are going to um, specify that rep uppercase B banana file one dot text, and we get those two lines. And finally, if I wanted to ignore the case and get all of the files that contained um, banana with upper or lowercase B, I would do grep dash I banana file one dot text. Okay, we can um, <clears throat> but we can do a little bit more with grep. Um, it gives you options for listing lines that occur before or after the matching line, and I found this to be really useful when I'm looking for content that that can vary, but occurs in a known location relative to a matching pattern. So let's say we're looking at the output from a for, from a chemistry calculation where we know that say the say say the free energy always appears two lines before a line containing a certain string, or say a few lines after. So if we go back to my an example file one dot text, I'm going to do a search on pump quad. If I do a dash capital B, followed by a followed by an integer, I'm going to print the three lines before that matching line in addition to the matching line. So. Here I did a grep dash b3 kumquat file one dot text, and I get three lines that, that occur before um, before pair kumquat grape. Um, if I do a dash capital A, again followed by an integer, in this case two kumquat file one dot text, I'm going to print the two lines that occur after the matching line. And if kumquat had appeared multiple times within this file, I would get the um, preceding or the following lines for each for, for each individual match. <clears throat> Rep can also do an inverted match to print lines that do not match a pattern. So on the left, we're using grep to search for all the lines that contain a line. Um, we do a grep lime and sorry. 
And I realize I have a, oh, no, no, sorry, that is correct. I'm looking at all of the lines with, sorry, all of the files within this directory. I do a grep line star, and now I find all of files that, and lines that contain, contain line. So we can see in file one, there were, there were two lines, and in file two, there were three lines. I could also do a grep dash V to see all of the files that do not contain a line. And in this case, um, output from file one and file two is all of those lines not containing, not containing line. Okay, we can also um, we can also use grep to get to get um, to line counts and lists of, of matching lines. So again, let, let's go back. We do a grep line star so that when you see all the lines from all the files in this directory that contain line, so we can see two occurrences in file one, um, three occurrences in file two. If I do a grep dash C line, um, now I'm gonna see that that file one has two occurrences that match, file two, three occurrences. Um, I find that the um that the line count option is really um is really useful. Let's say if you're following the progress of a, of a calculation where the say results are printed out every time step, you could search for a characteristic line, figure out how far you are along the calculations. I could also list the files that contain the match. So in this case, I don't care about the um, number of occurrences. I just want to know which files contain that could contain that string. So I could do a grep dash little l in order to um, find out that file one dot text contains comquat, or a grep dash capital L to find all the files that do not contain comquat. All right, so up to this point, our pattern has been a string literal, for example, a lime or banana, but grep can recognize more complex patterns that use character classes, anchors, and even regular expressions. So again, looking at the top here, um, all of the occurrences of pair within file one, I can use an, I can use the caret character, what we call an anchor, in order to find just those lines that began with pair, so in this case, within single quotes, caret pair, or um, I could use the dollar anchor to find lines that end with pair. So we use grep and then in single quotes, pair dollar. So now we only have lines that, that end with pair. All right, so we're gonna make things, um, we're gonna go look, look at the next set of more complicated tools. And this is said and awk. Um, I put these in an arbitrary order. I'm not gonna say that said is any more difficult than awk or vice versa. They're, um, they're about the same, very complex, powerful tools. Um, from Ying, can, can we use double quotes? Yes, I believe that you can use double quotes, but go ahead and double check that. All right, so now we're gonna get into two really, really powerful tools. Um, said and awk. Um, so said is what we call a, a stream editor. It operates on a stream of data, goes through files um, one line at a time and applies, applies an operation. Now, said is really, really complex. We could spend days exploring said, and in fact, entire books have been written about it. Um, if you want to do a really, really deep dive, there's a book called Said and Awk. Uh, it's about, I think it's about 300 pages long that covers that covers these two tools. Um, we only have an hour today, so we are not going to do that deep of a dive. But if you do want to learn more, um, I have links here to the to the said manual, um, to um, the the said SourceForge page, and um, and two tutorials. So you can do a lot with said. But we're just going to look at the um, at, at the most common use cases today, and most often you're going to use said to apply a substitution to each line of a file. So again, while some of these operations can easily be done using a global replace in a traditional editor like VI or Emacs, said has the advantage that it can be scripted, and also it's important. It's right there in the name, stream editor. 
It works on a stream of data, which means that the entire file does not need to fit into does not need to fit in memory. So if we need to make substitutions, say in a in a very large file, gigabyte or gigabytes in size, we're not going to be able to open that in VI or Emacs. We're going to have to use a tool like SED. The most common use of SED is just going to be do the substitution. So SED single quote S slash the thing that we want to replace slash the replacement and then closing with it again with a single quote. Um, and I realize here that I accidentally got a got, got a back quote to do to the autocorrect and I will fix that in the next version of the slides. Um, we can also do a global replace. So we can use um, S slash the um, replacement, sorry, what we're gonna replace slash what the replacement is gonna be slash and follow that with G. And that will ensure that every occurrence in each line of the file will be will be substituted. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to look at a few examples here. So, in, in the first case in the upper left, the first instance in each line is going to be substituted. So, we do a sed s um, single quote slash pair slash xxxx slash and closing with a single quote. So we'll see now that the first occurrence of pair in each line is going to be is going to be replaced with xxxx. Um, said doesn't actually know about color. I just did this so um, so we could highlight the results. So we can see that in um, that that then lines that had multiple occurrences of pair only the first one was substituted. So if we look at the third line of output, the the first occurrence of pair is replaced by four x's, but the second occurrence is um, still there. If I use the global replace option, every occurrence of pair is replaced by, by the four X's. Um, I can use the, use the caret, um, which we saw earlier with, with grep. So I could say, I only want to make the substitution if pair appears at the start of the line. And then finally, I could use the dollar if I just want to look at instances that occur at the end of each line. Um, Another powerful feature of said, I don't find that I use this as often, um, but is for it is for printing out just specific lines of a file. Um, so, for example, if I wanted to print out just the fifth line of a file, um, I could use said dash n and then quotes five, five quoted five followed by p. Um, five means the fifth line. P means that we want to print. And now we just get the fifth line of the file. Um, if I wanted to um, print a range of lines, in this case, three through five, I'm going to have three comma five within the parens followed by P. And now I'm going to get lines three through five. And I can also specify a specify a stride using the syntax two to tilde three. This means I'm going to print every third line starting at line two. Again, you probably won't use this nearly as often as you do the substitution, but you should be aware that it exists. Um, one of the gotchas was said is if you're trying to do a um, substitution in place. So remember that stream that said is a stream editor. We're going through each, but we're, we're going through the file line by line. Um, so we cannot take the output of said and redirect it into the same file. So for example, if I wanted to do a substitution on, on file three, let's say I do a sed substitute pair with xxxx, file three.txt, and redirect that into file three. If I then look at results, um, we're gonna see that there's no, no output. If we do wanna do this, we can either um, pipe the results into a temporary file, or we can use the dash I option to um, ensure that we're doing an edit in place. Be aware though, that if we do specify dash I, now set is gonna be required to um, re read this entire file, read this entire file into memory. So you probably don't wanna do this if you're working with very, very large files. Okay, let me just check the chat. Okay, no questions. Okay, and let's move on to awk. Um, awk, 
Again, like I said, is a very, very powerful tool. I'm going to say this is probably my, my favorite Linux utility. Um, name comes from the three creators, Alfred Ajo, Peter Weinberger, and Brian Kernigan. Um, lots of capabilities, and we're just going to limit ourselves to a few of the simple and commonly used ones. Again, if you want to do a really, really deep dive, you can always get the book on Set and Awk, or you can go online, and I have a... Um, a few links here to the to, to the awk manual which will probably take you a few weeks to get through and a wiki book that has a lot of awk command line examples so awk is a pattern scanning and processing language consists of one or more rules containing an option and or an action now i should say awk is a full-fledged programming language it has arrays control statements and other um, other advanced features but we're going to ignore that for now so each of these um, awk programs, though, is going to consist of a pattern and an action. Now, short programs can be executed from the okay, can be executed from the command line as follows: awk, the um, pattern and action, sorry, pattern and action contained within single quotes, and then one or more files. And then we can also have multiple actions that are separated by semicolons. And then there are finally special actions that are executed once at the start and once at the end of the execution. And I'll give a few examples of these. So probably the most common use of awk is, is to print selected fields from each line of a file. So, so awk, like said, is gonna process the file one line at a time, and it's going to split the input into fields referenced by position. So to access these, you would um, use $1, and so on. And finally, the last field can also be accessed um, using NF, where NF is the number of fields. So let's look at a, a, at a file. Um, we're going to call this people.txt. And it has a list of, um, list of names, animals, foods, and colors. So for example, Bob, dog, meatloaf, banana, blue, and so on. So if we wanted to get just the first and third and last um, what last field in each of those lines, I could do awk, and then the name of my awk program in these single quotes, print $1, $3, and NF. So now we get columns one, three, and five, Bob, meatloaf, blue, Cindy, Pete's purple, and so on. Now the... In the previous example, we really didn't need to use the NF variable. It was a, it was a pretty simple case. We could look at a file. Um, there are just um, there are just five columns, and each row has 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 all five columns. But NF is particularly valuable if you don't know the number of fields, or you're working with ragged data where each line has a different field count. So let's look at the field. Um, look at the file ragged.txt. We got field one, field two, field three. Next line has two fields, one and two. And that line after that has four fields, one through four. If I do awk print $NF, I'm gonna get the last field from each of those lines. Now awk can also take a search pattern and include other texts in the, in, in the output. Um, so let's say that I wanted to um, not, not just get columns one and three, but I want to have some text in between. So I could have um, for my awk script, print dollar one. And then here in quotes, I have a, have a string literal, favorite food is, followed by dollar three. So now we get Bob, favorite food is meatloaf, Cindy, favorite food is pizza, and so on. And if I wanted to um, limit to, to lines matching a particular string, say in this case, pizza, I could have here in um, between slashes pizza, print dollar one, dollar three. So now I get um, the, the first and third field just from those lines that contain the word pizza. Um, by default, awk uses white space as the delimiter, but this can be changed using the dash capital F option. Really useful when working with comma separated via, comma separated value files. So let's say I have a file states.txt, California, Sacramento, Valley, Quail, Poppy. Notice that I have some embedded spaces here. Um, so the state birth California is the Valley Quail and it does contain a space. Um, 
when I'm parsing this file, I probably want to split on the commas. So here I can use dash capital F followed by in, in, in single quotes comma as, as my new delimiter and then the rest of my um, the, the rest of my my awk program. So here I could write out California state bird is valley quail, Texas state bird is mockingbird and so on. Um, awk also provides math capabilities such as including square roots, logs, um, exponentiation, trig functions, and so on. And note that multiple actions are separated by semicolons. So let's say that for, for each um, for, for each re record in my file, I wanted to calculate the sum and the product of the, of the first two fields. I could specify variables. I'm going to call it here sum. Set it equal to dollar one plus dollar two. Product set that equal to dollar one times dollar two, and then finally print dollar one dollar two sum and product. And notice that I'm using semicolons to separate those actions. And the next few examples just show how we can use um, <clears throat> how we can use trig functions, logarithms, and square roots. Um, let's see, <clears throat> and then finally. Awk applies operations to each line, but we can use um, the begin and end keywords to, addition, to execute additional code just once at the start or the end of file processing. Um, commands can be broken across multiple lines for convenience, and we can do CSAW formatted printing using printf. So here, for example, let's say um, <clears throat> in the beginning, I needed to um, predefine a variable. Setting pi equals three to pi equal to three point one four one five nine, and I wanted to print out a header column x y sine of x cosine of x, and then do my calculations. So when I execute this, I'm going to get my get my header column. Pi has been defined so that I could use in these calculations, and here's my output. And then finally, um. And this is this is something that I came across relatively recently, is awk can can specify variables that are remembered from line to line. Um, a really common operation is let's say we have a file containing numerical data, and we want to we want to we want to calculate say a sum or an average in that column. What you might normally do is take that data again, cut and paste that, put it into a spreadsheet. Um, and use the um, use the sum or average function, but I could also define variables. So here I'm going to say s1 plus equals dollar one. Um, this is using the the C syntax. Um, at s2 plus equals dollar two, and then I'm going to um, and, and then I'm going to print the entire line without any arguments. Print. Um, specifies, prints out the entire line. And then at the end, I'm going to calculate the average. I'm going to print out S1 divided by NR, the number of records, S2 divided by NR, again, the number of records. Um, and you can see here, we get the we, we get the average for, for each of those columns. And I see that we have a question in the chat. Okay, can you use awk with other file types as such as net CDF. Um, Catherine, I have I have never done that. Um, I believe that net CDF is a binary format, in which case you wouldn't be able to use awk. Um, awk is a um, awk works on plain text files, but but I could be wrong. Um, and I'd be happy to to follow up in the question and answer session um, in, in a few minutes. Right. Um, I have a couple of case studies in here, and I realize we're almost at the top of the hour, so I am not going to um, I, I am not going to go through these. But I do have a few examples of how I use awk and said and grep and, and other tools in, in some of my workloads. In particular, during the breaking in of new supercomputers, where we had to run a large number of high performance Linpack or um, for natural language processing um, jobs, and also expanding on the on the split example I talked about earlier of how we can get that um, 
how, how we can get the delimiter back into the um, into the start of each annotation line. But with that, I'm going to cover just one last topic, and that is the use of large language models with these tools. So I think awk and sed are, are wonderful tools. Um, you can go down the rabbit hole. You could spend a long time really trying to trying to master them. What I'm going to say is maybe don't spend too much time on them. It's good to know that all can said and sort and these other tools exist. Um, but you probably you probably want to be spending more time on your uh, on your coursework or on your research than then mastering all of the uh, all of the options for these tools. So I'm going to say it's good to know a bit about these about these tools. Know that they exist. Know what they can do. But you can also use these la large language models to help you. So, um, in fact, I just did this last week. I went to ChatGPT and I said, "Can you give me an awk one-liner to print the second and fourth fields from a file?" And ChatGPT said, "Certainly. Here's an awk one-liner. Um, this is a this is a pretty pretty simple example. I didn't need uh, I didn't need ChatGPT to do this, but if I didn't use awk on a regular basis, and I was on from, you know, couldn't quite remember the syntax. That this was big help. So there it was: awk print dollar two dollar four followed by your file dot text. And then I said, all right, now can you add the condition that this is only done for lines where the second field is greater than the fourth field? And um, chat chat GPT help and said, here's a modified version of that awk one liner. And we see that our um, that that our pattern or our condition is dollar two greater than great greater than dollar four. Let me see. I think I have a oh oh uh, that that thank you, Aaron, um, for for the response. <clears throat> okay, um, another example. Um, you you using sort. Um, I said. I asked ChatGPT, can you give me a Linux command to sort a file by the second field numerically and then by the first field in reverse alphabetical order? So this is, as, as far as sort goes, a, a relatively complex sort, sort command. So, um, you know, ChatGPT was, was able to help, told me sort dash T um, and then followed by um, a single space within single quotes. So that specified that the fields are separated by a space. Um, and then dash K2, comma 2N, which means that we're going to sort by the second field numerically. And then dash K1, comma 1R, which says that we're going to sort by the first, then sort by the first field in reverse alphabetical order. So just to wrap up, um, Linux gives you a powerful suite of tools for doing text manipulation. They can improve your productivity and reduce the likelihood of making errors. And to me, you know, th these are both really, really good reasons, but especially the second one, avoiding, uh, avoiding the possibility of making errors because you were just getting tired from doing a lot of cutting and pasting. Um, don't be discouraged if you didn't understand everything in, in, this, in, in this presentation. We covered a lot of material in a pretty short time. If you haven't seen awk and said before, this might have been a little dense. But I'm going to say work through these examples at your own pace. You have the um, GitHub repo available to you. We barely scratched surface, especially for the more complex tools, such as said and awk. Head paste, tail, you know, really not much to those, but awk and said, you can go much, much deeper if you want to. And then finally, know that these large language models can, can help, especially for the more complex tools. But we recommend though, that you at least know the basics so that you can formulate meaning, meaningful prompts. And I will also add, be careful though, with large language models, don't take, um, Don't take the results as the absolute truth. I've been playing around with these lately um, in a completely different field. I was asking it to explain um, so some of the nuclear processes going on and going on within stars. And they actually got the, got the nuclear physics a little wrong. Um, so I'm sure that the same thing can happen if you um, ask an LLM to generate an awk or a said script. So 
It's probably going to be right, but I'm going to suggest though that you take the um, that they take what was produced. Make sure that you understand it and test it on some small data. All right. Well, if that is it. Um, that thank you, Jackie. Um, that thanks, Jen. Um, that thank you so much again. Be sure to click on the survey, and we hope to see you in a couple of weeks.